Hey guys and welcome back for another mystery, a mystery which I'm shocked isn't more well known, or at least I'm surprised I didn't know more about this one before anyway. Today we're going to be talking about the Cleveland Torso Murders, a spate of murders which happened between 1935 and 1938 in Cleveland, Ohio in the USA. In this time, at least 12 victims lost their lives, only two of whom were ever positively identified. And to this day, the person responsible is yet to be found, a brutal killer left to roam the streets. You may also occasionally hear this case referred to as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. All of this happened around the time of the Great Depression, a worldwide economic depression that took place during the 1930s. But it began in the USA with the collapse of the US stock market, and cities across the country were hit hard. It seems the depression really hit its peak in the US around 1932, and after that point the dollar very slowly began to rise again, but the negative effects would be seen and felt for many years after. The depression was particularly rough on the state of Ohio, where by 1933 more than 40% of factory workers and 67% of construction workers found themselves unemployed. Approximately 50% of industrial workers in Cleveland specifically found themselves without a job. In total, the unemployment rate of the state reached 37.3%. That's more than one in three people without a job. And many who did manage to maintain work were dealing with cut hours and cut wages. Lots of people in the cities of Ohio moved to the country in desperation, at least there they'd have the option to at least grow their own food. So as you can imagine, the situation in the cities was pretty dire, Cleveland being no exception. But despite the depression and people in general moving away from cities, the population of Cleveland continued to grow. And Cleveland was in a pretty good position for work for labourers, as the steel and manufacturing industry began to grow throughout the 30s. In fact, Cleveland was the sixth largest city in the USA at the time. The working poor generally lived in very poor conditions in shanty towns that began to pop up on the outskirts of towns and cities, often known colloquially as Hoovervilles, after the president Herbert Hoover, who didn't exactly do much to help the situation in the country. The Hooverville in Cleveland took base in an area known as the Cleveland Flats, on the banks of the Cuyahoga River, which made sense as this is where you generally found the steel mills in Cleveland. Extending from the Cleveland Flats was Kingsbury Run, a very dangerous shanty town running up to about East 90th Street. The train tracks ran through, and I think still do run through Kingsbury Run, making it an ideal place for transients to rest. They could travel to where the work was, and then escape Cleveland easily during the rough winters, heading to other cities with strong industries. Being essentially homeless and living in what was called the hobo jungle of Kingsbury Mill, you didn't exactly want to be hanging around when the temperature dropped. To the east of Kingsbury Run, you had what was known as the Roaring Third, an area of bars, brothels and gambling dens, an area where it was noted a lot of less than savoury people would often hang out. So I hope there I've set the scene adequately for you. The situation in Cleveland for the working poor was bleak. No real homes, living in tents and makeshift tin shacks, no heat, scraping by day by day. It was an area of intense poverty. A lot of people turned to sex work and alcohol in an attempt to get through their days. And these people would sadly become a very easy target for a murderer who would soon become known as the Butcher of Kingsbury Run. We'll start this story on the 5th of September 1934, when a woman's torso with her thighs still attached was discovered by a young man washed up on the shore of Lake Erie, the lake on the edge of which Cleveland sits. According to the Doe Network, what was found was just the lower half of the woman's torso, thigh still attached but amputated at the knees. The authorities were called to the scene where another search yielded only a few other body parts, but I'm not sure which parts. For certain, her head was never found, and it seems that her hands weren't either. 
In his subsequent examination, the coroner noted that there was some sort of chemical preservative on the skin, which had turned it tough, red and leathery. Without the head, there's little we can know about this woman, except she was approximately 33 to 37 years old, white and female. She would soon come to be known as the Lady in the Lake, and to this day, we don't know her true identity. Being the first body that was found, no one had any reason to think that the Lady in the Lake was the victim of a serial killer. In fact, the term serial killer wouldn't even be coined for another 30 years, and this case of the Cleveland Torso murderer is often said to be one of the first serial killing cases in the USA, although we will know that's probably not quite true. This all happened at a time when it was considered that people only really killed people they knew, that people killed people they deemed who had wronged them in a moment of passionate anger. It was inconceivable that anyone would go around murdering people just because they wanted to. But alas, that's exactly what it seems a Cleveland Torso murderer did. Even when a year later a second body was found, and then another, and another, the Lady of the Lake wasn't deemed to be a victim of the same person. In fact, it wasn't until two years later that she was deemed by some as a victim. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing, because there are 12 official victims of this murderer. Although a lot of sources cite the Lady of the Lake as being an official victim, she's not actually included in this number as far as I can find. She's often referred to as Victim Zero. The confusion here is likely because she was found in a different area of the city than the rest. She was found at Lake Erie, whilst all the rest of the victims would be found in Kingsbury Run and the immediate area. The official beginning of this case would come on the afternoon of the 23rd of September 1935, when two young boys were playing at the foot of a steep embankment which had been dubbed Jackass Hill by the locals. Before long, the boys came across the body of a headless man and tell an adult what they'd found. Soon, two policemen were on the scene and they swiftly found a second body at the foot of East 49th Street and Praha Avenue, noting that both bodies had been washed and drained of blood. In an archived article by Marilyn Bardsley, she noted that the police report read, The bodies of two white men, both beheaded, lying in the weeds. Both bodies were naked except that one of them had socks on. After an extensive search, the heads of both men were found buried in separate places, one about 20 feet away from one of the bodies and the other head was buried about 75 feet away from the other body. Both men's penises had been severed from their bodies and were found near one of the heads. We also found an old blue coat, light cap and a blood-stained union suit. Nearby was a metal bucket containing a small quantity of oil and a torch. It was apparent that oil, acid or some chemical was poured over one of the bodies as it was burnt to quite an extent. It was also evident that both bodies had been there several days as they had started to decompose. Victim 1, as he was named, had leathery skin, known as being similar to bacon rind, and this was eventually thought to be the result of scorching after oil had been applied. It seems that whatever they thought this was, it was later linked to being the same as the lady in the lake. They had the same sort of skin texture. Victim 1 was thought to have been dead 7 to 10 days, with his cause of death being decapitation, hemorrhage and shock. He was estimated to be between 40 and 45 years old, 5 foot 6 and 165 pounds, with dark brown hair. He had been decapitated whilst alive with a very sharp instrument. Victim 2 was thought to have only been dead 2-3 to three days at the time his body was found. He was in his 20s with blue-grey eyes, brown hair and a light complexion, 5 foot 1 and about 155 pounds. He was completely nude except for a pair of black cotton socks. His cause of death was the same as victim 1 and there were rope burns on each wrist, showing he'd been tied up. There was no denying that his death was brutal, particularly deranged. Decapitation is an unusual form of murder. It's usually something which happens after death in an effort to hide evidence or identity. It's not often the cause of death. Victim 2 was soon identified by a fingerprint as a man called Edward Andresee. 
his brother and father later confirming this at the morgue. Andrassy would be one of only two victims to be identified. He was 28 years old and lived nearby at 1744 Fulton Road. Notably, he was not a resident of the shanty town at Kingsbury Run. He had previously worked at Cleveland City Hospital on the psychiatric ward, but at the time of his death, he was unemployed like so many others. Andrassy didn't have the best of reputations and he'd been arrested several times for intoxication and even once on a concealed weapons charge for which he actually spent time in the workhouse. There were plenty of potential suspects in his murder. Just two months before his death, a man came to the family home and said he was going to kill Edward for paying attention to his wife. Whether that was a flirt or a full-blown affair, I don't know. He had also recently been in a fight and had stabbed an Italian man and now he was scared that the mob was after him. In general, he hung around with some very unsavoury characters, running in not so good crowds and he spent a lot of time in the Roaring Third, the area with all the gambling, drinking and brothels. It was even rumoured that he was, gosh forbid, a homosexual man. And I don't think it was much of a surprise to anyone when he turned up dead. But was it one of these threats that killed him, or was it someone else entirely? The fact that his body was found alongside another suggests to me that it was someone else entirely. They weren't even murdered at the same time, victim 1 was placed there about a week before Andrassy came along. Police did try to trace Andrassy's steps before he died to figure out who he'd come into contact with, but they had zero luck. He last left his family home on Thursday, September 19th, and it was suspected by the coroner that he died on the Friday night, his body then found the following Monday. No one saw him at all after he left his home, not a single witness ever came forward, and Andrew's face was a face well known in the local area. Eventually the case just went cold and they had no luck identifying the other body, who came to be known simply as John Doe One. According to Wikipedia, although do note I saw this nowhere else, it was later thought that John Doe 1 may have been at the bottom of Jackass Hill for as long as three to four weeks before his discovery. And so the case went quiet. It wasn't until the 26th of January 1936 that yet another body was found. A local butcher called Charles Page contacted the police to report a murder saying that he'd been informed by a woman that there was a body lying against a building on East 21st Place. Page said that he'd investigated himself and had indeed found severed parts of a human body. And the authorities found the same when they investigated, finding body parts in a half bushel basket, some parts wrapped in burlap sacks, along with a suit of two-piece white cotton underwear wrapped in newspapers. Found were the lower half of a woman's torso, both her thighs and her right upper extremity, which I assume was the top of her right arm. A hand was also found, I'm assuming, because they were actually able to fingerprint the woman. Thanks to a local dog who started howling and barking at around 2.30am in the place where the body was later found, it was suggested that this is the time the parts were dumped. The coroner determined that this woman had been dead for two to four days and once again she'd been dismembered with a very sharp knife. Thanks to the fingerprints and previous convictions for prostitution, the woman's identity was soon confirmed as 42-year-old Florence Polilio, described as a stout woman with reddish hair and a fair complexion. Florence would be the final victim of the Cleveland Torso murder to be identified. She was said to have been a nice, kind woman, but with a serious drinking problem which would cause her to become rowdy, and she had a string of abusive relationships. Like the rest, Florence often hung out in the Roaring Third and had many acquaintances there, but none who could help the police with their investigation. On the 7th of February, the rest of Florence's body was found behind a vacant house. Everything except her head, which at this point they discovered had been decapitated, just like the two previous victims. Due to the muscles in her neck being retracted, it was noted that once again the decapitation was the cause of death, and that the killer had waited until rigor mortis had set in before they dismembered the rest of the body. 
This is an interesting point to me. Along with the fact that a very sharp instrument was used with surgical-like precision, it suggests that the killer had some knowledge of how human bodies worked. The obvious places to look at here are people in the medical field or perhaps even butchers. But that's asking a lot, seeing as the cases weren't even all tied together by this point, they were just random murders. Not long before this murder, a man called Elliot Ness had been appointed as a safety director of the city's police and fire departments. Ness's was a name that was already fairly well known across the USA, as he'd spent the previous few years enforcing the prohibition laws in Chicago, and his team was ultimately responsible for bringing down the great Al Capone. Ness was a smart appointment at the hands of Republican Harold Burton, who had recently been elected as the mayor of Cleveland. There was a general panic throughout the city at the crime levels, and the fact that a lot of their police force was also corrupt. Burton promised to fix all of this, and Ness was an obvious appointment. Burton was also probably thinking of the fact that Cleveland was hosting the Republican National Convention in 1936, and there was the Great Lakes Exposition as well, which is this huge fair on the shore of the lake. A lot of eyes were on Cleveland that year. But it seems that Ness would bite off more than he could chew with this job. The Cleveland torso murderer would haunt him for the rest of his life. I mean, he was appointed to just sort out general crime in the city. I don't think anyone ever warned him about a serial killer. On the 5th of June 1936, two boys who had skipped school to go fishing came across a pair of trousers in the east side of the city, right in the heart of hobo country. Tied up in the trousers was a man's severed head. They ran back home and told their mother, who called the police later that afternoon. The police headed out and found the head, before finding the body hidden in some bushes directly in front of the police office. It seems like someone might have been taunting them. This man, who would later come to be known as John Doe II, or the Tattooed Man, was a tall, slim man in his mid-twenties. He had six tattoos, a cupid superimposed on an anchor, a dove underneath the words Helen Paul, a butterfly, a popular cartoon figure called Jigs, an arrow through a heart and a flag, and the initials WCG. Investigators suspected that this man may have been a sailor due to the nature of his tattoos. Despite taking photos to local tattoo parlours and well-known sailor hangouts though, no one knew the man or the tattoos in the photos. They even put this man on display in the morgue and literally thousands of people came to see if they could identify him, but nobody ever could. A death mask was even made and was exhibited to 7 million people who came to the Great Lakes Expo over the next couple of years, but still, no one ever recognised him. Close to the body, they found some expensive blood-stained clothing, on which they found a mark suggesting that the owner's initials might have been JD. They suspected that the man was not a transient or homeless, despite the area in which he was found. He was clean-shaven, well-nourished, and assuming that the clothes did belong to him, well-dressed. There was no evidence of blood around the body either, suggesting that he'd been killed elsewhere, drained of blood, and then placed in Kingsbury Run to be found. Once again, the coroner said that the man had been killed by decapitation. It was at this point that the coroner made the link to other victims, and he mentioned this to Elliot Ness but the police were going to take some convincing. Despite the cause of death being the same in all of these cases, some of the bodies were completely dismembered, others were just decapitated, some victims were male and some were female. Based on their very limited understanding of multiple murders, this just didn't make any sense, it didn't fit any pattern that they could see. But eventually there was only one conclusion to come to that they had a serial killer on their hands, before the term serial killer even existed. But the police knew they had to be careful with letting this information out to the public. They couldn't have people too scared to leave their homes with the big summer that the city had coming up. It had to have this illusion of business as usual. 
The investigation into the tattooed man was still ongoing when on the 22nd of July 1936 they received yet another call about a murder. A teenage girl had found a severely decomposed headless body in Big Creek on the southwest side of the city. But this murder was somewhat different from the rest. It was nowhere near Kingsbury Run and it was pretty clear that the victim had been killed in the spot where he laid. But once again, he had been decapitated while still alive. It was suspected that this man died even before the tattooed man and the level of decomposition made fingerprinting impossible. The victim was about 40 years old with long hair and poor clothing. As he was found so close to the train tracks, it was thought that he was likely a hobo who travelled in and out on the train tracks. He was confirmed to be a white man between 25 and 30 years old of medium height and muscular build. If his body hair was anything to go by, he had light brown hair and he would later become known as John Doe 3. After yet another murder, no one could deny that the same person was responsible for all. Then comes September 10th when a homeless man was sat waiting for a train. In a nearby stagnant creek, this man noticed a human torso floating in two halves. The police were notified who turned up and removed the body, sending it to the morgue. In an effort to locate the rest of the body, the fire rescue squad was called in to drag the creek. They found pieces of flesh on a ledge, suspected to be where the body was thrown over, the bottom half of two legs and a right thigh. They also found some clothing, a grey felt hat and a blue work shirt covered in blood wrapped in newspaper. Hundreds of locals came out to watch as the police scoured the creek for evidence and body parts. And at this point, the police had to accept that they were no longer going to be able to keep the investigation on the down low. Rumours had been circling for months and the papers had started to pick up on the story. They'd even named the perpetrator by this point, the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. And fear started to sweep through the neighbourhoods. Ness decided that what they needed to do was a clean-up of Kingsbury Run, particularly the areas on which the bodies had been found. Every homeless person in the area was brought in for questioning before being warned about the killer and being told to move on, find somewhere else to live for their own safety. Which is hilarious because they're homeless, they've got nowhere else to go. 20 detectives were permanently assigned to the case, but there was nothing they could actually do to help solve it besides just questioning people. There was no evidence and no clues to follow. Soon, the public started to contact the police with information. Neighbours who they saw walking around at strange hours, people carrying large packages, or just people who owned big knives. Ness ordered that every single lead that came in must be followed through until the very end. And they did actually eventually find the name of a possible suspect, a man called Jack Wilson, who was a former butcher, known to always carry a large butcher's knife with him wherever he went. But this lead ultimately didn't end up going anywhere. It seems that they eventually decided that the only way they were going to be able to catch the perpetrator was through actually catching him in the act. They'd decided that it was likely a he due to the strength required to commit these murders. Officers would follow patients who had recently been released from the mental wards of the hospital for several days at a time. They would dress as hobos and hide in the bushes around Kingsbury Run, just watching and waiting. They would hang around known gay bars and steam baths, trying to see if they could find any homosexual men with sadistic tendencies. The lead detective in this case, Peter Merrilow, had a personal vendetta against gay men and had spent a lot of his time trapping them in the act before being put on this particular case of the murderer. It seems like this vendetta followed him to this case. They followed leads on the perpetrator being a marijuana addict due to the plentiful supply of deadly weed growing wild around the railroad tracks. The head of the Federal Narcotic Bureau in Cleveland said, Both the desire for a thrill and a homicidal obsession are easily induced by the loco weed cigarettes. 
The Cleveland News even offered a $1,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the murderer. That was a crazy amount of money, especially considering the depression and the conditions people were living in at the time. If anyone living in the shanty town of Kingsbury Run knew of anything, this surely would have been enough of an incentive to get them to come forward. But nobody ever did. It didn't seem like anyone knew anything. What the authorities could decipher about the killer was limited. They decided that he was not insane, that he may have been a homosexual man due to the fact that many of the John Doe's had their genitals mutilated. The killer definitely had a deep understanding of the human anatomy, which wasn't all that common in the 1930s. They had to be large and strong, not only to kill the victims, but also to dismember and transport them. The majority of the time, the victims were not found where they'd been murdered. The killer was likely using an abandoned warehouse or shed to commit his crimes. After two of the earlier victims were identified, it was suspected that the killer would go to greater lengths to conceal identities, so from that point he further butchered the bodies. They also likely purposefully chose victims who they knew would not be identified in the local area, so a lot of the Jane and John Doe's were probably transients more than anything else. The next victim wouldn't appear for a number of months, until the 23rd of February 1937. This case had many parallels with Victim Zero, the Lady of the Lake. A female torso washed up on the beach in the same place the Lady of the Lake had been found. Arms amputated, headless and torso bisected. It would be two months until the lower half of the torso would be found as well, floating off of East 30th Street, close to the mouth of the Cuyahoga River. It was speculated that the woman may have been dumped in the water around Kingsbury Run and then washed out to the lake. When she was first found, it was speculated that the woman had been dead for two to three days. She was between 25 and 35 years old, between 100 and 120 pounds with a light complexion and medium brown hair. She suffered with emphysema, suggesting that she lived in the heart of the city and had been pregnant before. She would become known as Victim 7 or Jane Doe 1. Her head was never found and unlike the other cases, it was not suspected that her cause of death was decapitation. It was thought that she was decapitated post-mortem. In an extra sick twist, the killer had inserted a trouser pocket inside the woman's rectum. On the 6th of June 1937, a teenager walking along the river discovered the partial skeleton of a woman in a rotting burlap sack underneath the Lorraine at Carnegie Bridge. The state of the body suggested that it had been there quite a while, as well as the fact that the newspaper the body was wrapped in was from June 1936. The woman was later confirmed to have died about one year beforehand. The woman was just five foot tall in life with small bones. Her arms and legs were missing, although her head was found nearby decapitated. She'd had extensive dental work done in life with gold crowns and saw that she was likely black due to her hair, the only black victim of this murderer. So now you've got a man who not only doesn't discriminate by gender, but also doesn't discriminate by ethnicity something very unusual even today in serial killers. It's not known if decapitation was the cause of this woman's death. Investigators did receive a letter in which it was suggested this victim was a woman named Rose Wallace, who worked as a sex worker. But after looking further into this, it was determined that this was likely not the case. Although still today, they're not entirely sure it might have been Rose Wallace, it might not have been. Seeing as they had Jane Doe's skull and extensive dental work, they did contact local dentists to see if anyone ever recognised the work, but no one did. Rose's own dentist was long dead, so they couldn't contact him to confirm. Of course, records weren't kept back then as they are nowadays. Exactly one month later, another body was found. The upper half of a man's torso plus two thighs floating in the river just below Kingsbury Run. Pieces of his body would slowly be recovered over the next few weeks, 
everything but a head, which we can assume was not disposed of like the rest. This man was about 40 years old, 5'8 and 150 pounds, with particularly well-groomed fingers, which suggests that maybe he didn't reside in Kingsbury Run. He'd only been dead a couple of days when he was discovered, killed by, you guessed it, decapitation. Unusually this time around, the killer had also removed all of the abdominal organs and heart from the torso. From there, things went quiet for a long time. Investigators began to think that the murderer had finally stopped or moved on to another city, but that was not to be the case. On the 8th of April 1938, only the lower part of a woman's leg was recovered from the Cuyahoga River. Despite hopes that this was not another victim, perhaps just a freak accident, in May, two burlap sacks containing more body parts were pulled out of the river, including a bisected torso, thighs and a foot. The heads and arms were never found. This woman was thought to be 25 to 30 years old, 5 foot 3 and 120 pounds. She was flat chested and had given birth by a C-section. She may have also had an abortion before and had had her appendix removed. The cause of death? Decapitation. She was never identified, known only as Jane Doe 3. Despite her being the 10th victim found, it's suspected that she was actually the last victim chronologically. As far as we're aware, no one died after her. But two more bodies were yet to be found. On August 16th, men came across a dismembered body at a dump at the end of East 9th Street. They came across a woman wrapped in rags, brown paper and cardboard. The heads and hands actually found alongside the rest of the body. As investigators scoured the scene for evidence, they also came across a skull inside a large tin can and further bones, which turned out to be male, another body. The woman was white, between 30 and 40 years old, 5 foot 4 and 120 to 125 pounds. She was fairly decomposed, but not entirely. It was suspected that she had died sometime between February and April, although it was thought her remains had only been in the dump for a few weeks. She was too decomposed to determine a cause of death, but it was thought, without a doubt, to be a homicide. They were able to get a fingerprint from this woman, but she was not in their file. She'd never committed a crime in Cleveland. The bones were that of a male between 30 and 40 years old, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 8, weighing about 135 to 150 pounds. This male had long, coarse, dark brown hair, and again, no cause of death was determined, but it was likely homicide. The discovery of these bodies did come with questions, because whilst the general MO seemed similar, we're talking decapitated bodies, dismembered, etc., these were the only bodies ever found in the dump. In general, the killer seemed to like leaving the bodies more out in the open to be found, not hidden away. Although then again the bodies were found, and perhaps they weren't very hidden at all. Elliot Ness was unsure if these really were victims of the Mad Butcher, but they are included on the official list of victims. So that brings us to the end of the full list and description of our victims. Edward Andresi was buried in St. Mary Cemetery and Florence Palilio was buried in Pennsylvania, I assume both at the behest of their families. Five of the does were buried in the Potter's Field section of Highland Park Cemetery in Ohio. As we know, this is an unsolved case. To this day, we don't know who was responsible for these murders. But that's not to say there haven't been multiple theories over the years. The lead investigator, Peter Marylow, the one I mentioned earlier, who spent a lot of his time focusing on gay men, noted similarities between the Cleveland murders and other similar murders happening in western Pennsylvania. It was theorised that the killer was travelling via the railway between each, and maybe other cities as well, committing their crimes. The headless body of an unidentified male was found in Newcastle, Pennsylvania on the 1st of July 1936, and then three headless victims were found in similar conditions near McKees Rocks in Pennsylvania in May 1940. The injuries were undeniably similar to what they saw in Cleveland, 
and Newcastle and Kingsbury Run just happen to be directly connected by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad line. In fact, Merrilow was so convinced that the killer travelled this line regularly that he took to travelling himself undercover to see if he could spot the killer. But of course, he never did. After the final two bodies were discovered, Elliot Ness became desperate. He'd been brought into Cleveland to overhaul the city's safety department to make it a safer place to live, but under his watch there had been a serial killer he'd been unable to apprehend with two of the bodies even being left in window view of his office. He was being taunted by this killer. Ness made a choice which ultimately would prove to be the wrong one, shock horror. Two days after the bodies were found in the dump, on the night of the 18th of August 1938, Ness led a midnight raid on the shanty towns in Kingsbury Run, arresting men, taking their fingerprints and sending them to the workhouses. Once the shanty town was empty, they scoured it for any clue as to the identity of the mad butcher, and then when that failed, they burned it to the ground. These men and women, and sometimes children, already homeless, lost everything they had. They lost their community. Whilst I often talk in my videos about how people tend to look down on and treat differently the homeless and sex workers, people of lesser means, the whole sociological climate was slightly different back in the 1930s. Pretty much everyone understood, or at least everyone in Cleveland understood and felt sorry for the people living in the shandy towns, understanding that they were just the unlucky ones who lost their jobs, they were forced to survive in any way they could. And then the police, the people who were supposed to be protecting them, caused these people to lose everything they had left. For a lot of people living in America through the Great Depression, things were hard. I mean, unless you're one of the really privileged rich people, you were probably under the assumption that if you lost your job or one wrong move or one bad investment, you were this close to living in the shanty towns yourself. Even the Cleveland press criticised the decision of the police harshly, saying that such shanty towns exist is a sorrowful reflection upon the state of society. The throwing into jail of men broken by experience and the burning of their wretched places of habitation will not solve the economic problem, nor is it likely to lead to the solution of the most macabre mystery in Cleveland's history. Ness had screwed up big time and this would haunt him for the rest of his life. But one thing did happen. The murders inexplicably stopped. Ness did have his suspects though and there are two which you'll often see spoken about in regards to this case. Frank Dolezal and Dr Frank Sweeney. I'll start by talking about Frank Dolezal because there doesn't seem to be quite as much to this theory. He was an immigrant bricklayer who was originally arrested in 1939 in relation to Florence Palillo's murder. It seems that they lived together for a period of time and he also had connections with both Andresi and Rose Wallace. Dolezal actually originally confessed to the crime but later recanted and claimed that the deputies had beaten him, that this confession had been coerced after he was interrogated for 40 hours straight. And as his confessions began to be investigated, it became clear that there was no case whatsoever against him. Despite this, he was due to stand trial anyway, but he was found dead in his jail cell not long before it began. The death was ruled a suicide, but a man called James Bedell, who spent decades researching these crimes, suspects that Dolezal was actually almost certainly murdered by the people who arrested him. He died by hanging by a rope that was just 5 foot 7 inches off the floor, despite the fact that Frank himself was 5 foot 8, and the autopsy revealed broken ribs. The theory goes the actual murderer was someone high up with political power, and that Dolezal was nothing more than a fool guy. If he was dead, then people would continue to believe that he was the one responsible. He couldn't argue his case in court, he couldn't prove it wasn't him, and it was looking like in court, he was going to be able to prove that. And interestingly, all official police records about this case have been destroyed. 
So all in all, Frank Dolezal probably isn't a good suspect. So much so that in 2010, money was actually raised by James Bedell and his team to finally put a headstone on Frank's grave, vindicating him once and for all. Which brings us to Dr. Frank Sweeney. He was born in 1894 in Kingsbury Run into poverty and he fought his entire life to make his way out of the poverty cycle. He worked all the way to medical school, he was the best in his class and was undeniably a very intelligent man. In 1928, he graduated from medical school and became a surgical resident at St Alexis Hospital in Kingsbury Run. Frank Sweeney also had a wife and two children. Everyone who knew him had only positive things to say about him until the point that they didn't. It seems eventually the decades of hard work took their toll and Frank became an alcoholic, so bad that no treatment could help him. Eventually his entire world began to fall apart, including his marriage. His wife filed for divorce and he was accused of being violent and abusive. Sweeney started drinking around 1927 and remained drunk from then until 1934, the year that the Lady of the Lake was discovered. There were also rumours that Sweeney was bisexual, which in the minds of investigators could explain why the mad butcher chose both men and women and would usually butcher the male genitals. Sweeney was a strong man, he had mental issues, he had the medical knowledge that they suspected the butcher had. His whole family had a history of psychosis, which was theorised was passed down onto him. But of course, all of this evidence is circumstantial. Maybe Frank Sweeney was just a shitty guy, but a lot of people are shitty without being murderers. Shortly after the burning of Kingsbury Run, Ness was under intense pressure to arrest someone in the murders, so at that point Sweeney was brought in for questioning. They quarantined him for three whole days to ensure that he was sober before the investigation, which was then conducted by three men, including the man who invented the polygraph test, which was brought in specially for this occasion. This was all very hush-hush because it turns out that Sweeney's first cousin was a powerful congressman, Martin L. Sweeney, and he could quite easily put a stop to any investigation. I can imagine it wouldn't have looked great for Martin Sweeney's campaign if his cousin of the same name was being accused of being a serial killer. Throughout the questioning, Sweeney was evasive and was clearly enjoying it, and the polygraph test showed that he was lying in regards to a lot of his answers. Although, of course, we know that even today, polygraph tests are unreliable. I can imagine this was even more the case back in the 1930s. Despite Ness being convinced that he had the right guy here, they never arrested Sweeney. Perhaps they knew that they would never be able to get a conviction with his connections. What happened next was very strange. Two days later, Sweeney checked himself into the Sandusky Veterans Hospital and from there he would spend the rest of his life jumping between hospitals. He was free to come and go as he pleased, he wasn't ever a prisoner, but they always kept an eye on him. In 1955, he was committed to the Dayton Veterans Hospital where he remained for the rest of his life. The theory here goes that the police knew they couldn't arrest him because of his connections, so instead they struck up a deal, perhaps with Sweeney himself or his cousin, the congressman, and perhaps they just knew if they kept in hospital, they could keep an eye on him. But was Sweeney really the one responsible for these murders, or was he just a violent, mentally ill alcoholic who enjoyed playing games with the police? Unless I've missed something in my research, I could find nothing to suggest they had any actual evidence against him, just a lot of circumstantial. Regardless, the murders stopped around this time. Was it because the shantytown was burned down? Was it because Frank Dolezal was now dead? Was it because Frank Sweeney was now in hospital? Or did the killer simply move on, knowing that he was on borrowed time, happy to let the police's other suspects take the fall. At the end of the day, the murderer could have been anyone, anyone strong enough to dismember bodies and transport them. 
it's more likely to be someone with medical or anatomical knowledge, but even a regular person could learn those kind of details if they dedicated time to it. So that's the story of the Cleveland Torso Murders, a case which I think in all likelihood is going to remain unsolved. It seems that in 2003 the Cuyahoga County Coroner and Cleveland Police did want to see if they could test DNA on postcards sent from Sweeney in hospital to Ness. Sweeney spent years just sending Ness really weird postcards. However, the Western Reserve Historical Society, who are in possession of the postcards, wouldn't agree to the testing. They said that removing the stamps for testing would destroy the postcards, and even if they did find remaining DNA, it wouldn't solve the murders, it would just confirm that Sweeney did indeed write the letters, which isn't exactly shocking news. As far as I can find, they have no DNA evidence from the scenes of any of the crimes. And that's that. Without DNA evidence, I'm not sure how they'll ever be able to solve this one, perhaps bar a family secret whispered down the generations. And the likelihood is that the killer isn't alive today to prosecute anymore. Thank you so much for watching, if you're still hanging around I just want to give a real quick shout out to some of my gold channel members. So I want to give a huge thank you to Billy Wolf, Grinny Door, John Wilson, Bob H, Susan RN, Alexandra Smith and Maddie Bernard. Thank you so much for your constant support and I suppose I'll see you all next week. Bye guys.